This sound file contains the spoken version of the Wikipedia article on Joachim Piper. The material was recorded on December 10th, 2017. Joachim Piper from Wikipedia, the free encyclopedia at en.wikipedia.org. Joachim Piper, also known as Jochen Piper, was a field officer in the Waffen SS during World War II and personal adjutant to Reichsfuhrer SS Heinrich Himmler between November 1940 and August 1941. Piper fought on both the Eastern Front against the Red Army and the Western Front against the Western Allies, and was awarded by Nazi Germany the Knight's Cross of the Iron Cross with oak leaves and swords. Piper was convicted of war crimes committed in Belgium and imprisoned for almost 12 years. He was accused of war crimes in Italy, but Italian and German courts concluded that there was insufficient evidence to warrant prosecution. After his release from prison, Piper worked for both Porsche and Volkswagen before moving to France, where he translated books from English to German under the nom de plume, quote, Rainer Bouchemont, unquote. Piper was murdered in France in 1976. Section 1. Early Life Piper was born on January 30, 1915, into a middle-class family from the Silesian region of Germany. His father, Captain Waldemar Piper, served in the Imperial German Army, and fought in the colonial campaigns in East Africa. In 1915, he retired from active duty for health reasons after contracting malaria. After the war, Valdemar Piper joined the Fry Corps and took part in the Silesian uprisings. Piper did not obtain the grades needed to continue to university. In 1926, Piper followed his older brother Horst and joined the Scout Movement, developing an interest in a military career. Piper's brother Horst joined the SS eventually reaching the rank of Hauptsturmführer. Horst participated in the Battle of France with the 3rd SS Division Totenkopf before being transferred to Poland, where he died in an accident. Section 2. SS Career Pre-World War II Piper turned 18 years old on the day that Adolf Hitler was appointed Chancellor of Germany. He volunteered to join the Hitler Youth together with his brother Horst. Piper wanted to join a cavalry division of the German Reichswehr, to gain skill at horse riding, he followed the advice of a family friend, General Walther von Reichenau, and enlisted in the 7th SS Reiterstandarte on October 12, 1933. On January 23, 1934, he was promoted to SS Mann with SS number 132,496. In 1934, during the annual Nuremberg Rally, Piper was promoted to SS Sturmann and later gained the attention of Heinrich Himmler. In his 1935 resume, Piper wrote, quote, As a result of a personal exhortation by the Reichsfuhrer SS Himmler, I have decided to strive for a career as an active senior SS officer, unquote. In January 1935, he was sent to a camp for Hitler Youth, SA and SS members, near Juderbog. After he completed the course, he was promoted to SS Unterscharfuhrer, Piper attended the SS Junkerschule, or Officer Training School, in Braunschweig from April 24, 1935 to March 30, 1936. The SS Officer School in Braunschweig had just been founded by Paul Hauser. Prior to founding the SS Officer School in Braunschweig, Hauser had carried out a program of reforms at the pre-existing SS Officer School in Bad Tools. After graduating from Junkerschule, Piper attended training at the Dachau Concentration Camp in February and March 1936. On April 20, 1936, Piper was promoted to SS Untersturmführer and was posted to the Liebstandarte SS Adolf Hitler Division under the command of Sepp Dietrich. He remained with the unit until June 1938. On July 4, 1938, Piper was appointed to an administrative post as an adjutant to Heinrich Himmler under the command of Karl Wolf. Piper worked in Himmler's anteroom in the SS Hauptamt at Prince Albrecht Strasse. As a member of the Reichsfuhrer SS staff, Piper was close to many high-ranking SS officers. He became one of Himmler's favorite adjutants. Piper later served on Himmler's personal staff and accompanied him on a state visit to Italy. On his 24th birthday, Piper was promoted to Obersturmfuhrer. Around this time, he met Sigurd Heinrichsen, a secretary on Himmler's personal staff and a close friend of Hedwig Pothast, Himmler's mistress. Piper and Henriksen were married on June 26, 1939, in a ceremony following SS customs. 
The couple lived in Berlin until the first Allied air raids on Berlin when Siggy was sent to Rotok, Upper Bavaria, near Himmler's second residence. The couple later had three children, Henrik, Elke, and Silke. Section 3. Poland and France on September 1st, 1939, Germany invaded Poland. As one of his adjutants, Piper joined Himmler's entourage on board the Reichsfuhrer SS's special train. Piper was with Himmler on September 20th in Bydogosk, Blomberg, when they witnessed the execution of 20 Poles. Piper later wrote that the experience left Himmler, quote, speechless, unquote, for several days. As Piper later told Ernst Schaefer, Hitler had previously ordered to eliminate the Polish intellectuals. After Poland was defeated, Piper assisted Himmler in developing policies and plans for controlling the Polish population. Later, Piper accompanied Himmler to Feldhermhal commemorative ceremonies in Munich on October 9, 1939. On December 13, 1939, Piper and Himmler witnessed the gassing of a resident of a psychiatric facility in Owenska near Poznan. In post-war interrogations, Piper described the experience in a detached, factual manner. In April 1940, Piper accompanied Himmler on trips to the Buchenwald and Flossenburg concentration camps, followed by a visit to Poland to meet with SS and police leader Wilhelm Redis and Brigade Führer Otto Rach. In early May, Himmler, accompanied by Piper, met with SS and police leader Odilo Globachnik in Lublin, with Piper noting in Himmler's appointment calendar Globachnik's plan to use Jewish forced labor for a massive fortification project. On May 17, 1940, Piper accompanied Himmler as he followed Waffen SS troops during the Battle of France. In Hassault, Piper obtained permission to join a combat unit and became a platoon leader in the 3rd Battalion of the 11th Company of 1st SS Division Liebenstarte SS Adolf Hitler. After seizing an artillery battery on the hills of Wattenberg, Piper was awarded the Iron Cross and promoted to Hauptsturm Führer. Rejoining Himmler's Personal Staff Piper returned to his duties as Himmler's adjutant on June 21, 1940. On July 10, 1940, he accompanied Himmler to the Berghof, where Reich leaders discussed the war and Hitler's plans. In October 1940, Piper accompanied Himmler to Madrid, where Himmler met with Franco. After passing through Metz, they stopped in Dax, where Himmler met with Theodore Eich, the commander of the SS Totenkopf Division. Shortly afterward, on November 14, 1940, Piper was appointed first adjutant to Himmler. In January 1941, Piper accompanied Himmler when he inspected Ravensbrück and Dachau concentration camps. In March 1941, together with Karl Wolf and Fritz Brock, they visited Auschwitz. Himmler and his staff then traveled to Norway, Austria, Poland, the Balkans, and Greece. This trip included a visit to the Lutz Ghetto, about which Piper later wrote, quote, It was a Maccabee image. We saw how the Jewish ghetto police, who wore hats without rims and were armed with wooden clubs, inconsiderately made room for us. The Jewish elders also presented Himmler with a bouquet of flowers." Unquote. Section 4. Invasion of the Soviet Union In February 1941, Himmler told Piper about the German plan Operation Barbarossa to invade the Soviet Union. The operation began on June 22, 1941. Behind the front lines, the Einsatzgruppen, under the control of the Reich Main Security Office, conducted a war against, quote, the Untermenschen, unquote, murdering communists, Jews, gypsies, and partisans. Piper's duties as first adjutant included providing Himmler with statistics from the Einsatzgruppen units about the mass killings on the Eastern Front. During the later summer of 1941, Werner Grothmann became Himmler's first adjutant. Although Piper was transferred to a combat unit, he remained in close contact with Himmler. In their ongoing correspondence, through to the end of the war, Himmler addressed Piper as, quote, my dear Jochen, unquote. Although no longer Himmler's official first adjutant, Piper continued to write in Himmler's diary until mid-September 1941. Piper may have been dispatched to the LSSAH earlier as an observer for the Reichsfuhrer SS, but available records show that he formally transferred to the LSSAH before October 1941. When he rejoined the LSSAH, it was engaged on the Eastern Front near the Black Sea. Piper spent several days at its headquarters when an injury to a unit commander gave Piper an opportunity to take command of the 11th Company. Transfer to a Combat Unit 
The 11th Company fought at Maripool and Rostov on Don. Piper was noted for his fighting spirit, although his unit suffered high casualties as a consequence of his aggressive tactics. The company killed a number of prisoners of war. During its combat action, the LSSAH was followed by Einsatzgruppen D, responsible for organizing the extermination of Jews and communists. Einsatzgruppen D continued its operations even when winter weather suspended active military operations. It shared the same winter quarters at Taganrog on the Azov Sea as the LSSAH, and on occasion, the division assisted Einsatzgruppen D with its operations. In May 1942, Piper learned of the death of his brother, Hans Hasso. During the same month, the LSSAH was transferred to France for rest and refit. En route to France, Piper left his unit and met with Himmler at its headquarters on June 1st. The meeting included a dinner attended by Himmler secretary Rudolf Brandt and Heinz Lammerding, a member of the staff headquarters of the SS division Totenkopf. In July 1942, Piper again met with Himmler and did not rejoin his battalion until August 1942. During its stay in France, the LSSAH was reorganized into a Panzer Grenadier Division, and Piper was promoted to commander of its 3rd Battalion. At the end of 1942, Piper received permission to visit his family. On January 30, 1943, he was promoted to SS Obersturmbannführer. Meanwhile, on the Eastern Front, the German situation had seriously worsened, especially in the Battle of Stalingrad. Piper's battalion left its quarters in France on January 31, 1943, for Lyubotin, near Kharkiv. It was immediately dispatched to the front. Relief of 320th Infantry Division During the 3rd Battle of Kharkov, Piper led the 3rd Battalion of the 2nd Panzer Grenadier Regiment, which broke 48 kilometers through Soviet lines to rescue the encircled 320th Infantry Division. Leading the ambulances back to the German lines, he found his route blocked by a Soviet ski battalion that had destroyed the main bridge across the Udi River. His unit fought through the city and repaired the bridge, securing an exit route for the ambulances back to the German lines. The repaired bridge, however, could not support the unit's heavy armored half-tracks and assault guns. Piper ordered his men back behind the Soviet lines to find another exit, and they returned to the German lines with few casualties. Massacre of Civilians The rescue culminated with a fury battle with the Soviet forces at the village of Krasnaya Polyana. Upon entering the village, However, Piper's troops made a terrible discovery. All the men in his small rear guard medical detachment left there had been killed and then mutilated. An SS sergeant in Piper's ration supply company, Otto Sirk, claimed that Piper responded in kind. Quote, in the village, the two petrol trucks were burnt and 25 Germans killed by partisans and Soviet soldiers. As a revenge, Piper ordered the burning down of the whole village and the shooting of its inhabitants, unquote. On May 6, 1943, Piper was awarded the German Cross in Gold for his achievements in February 1943 around Kharkov, where his unit gained the nickname the, quote, Blowtorch Battalion, unquote. Reportedly, the nickname derived from the torching and slaughter of two Soviet villages where their inhabitants were either shot or burned. Ukrainian sources, including surviving witness Ivan Kiselev, who was 14 at the time of the massacre, described the killings at the village of Yafromokova and Semyonokova on February 17, 1943. On February 12th, Wapen SS troops of the LSSAH occupied the two villages, where retreating Soviet forces had wounded two SS officers. In retaliation, five days later, LSSAH troops killed 872 men, women, and children. Some 240 of these were burned alive in the church of Yefremovka. In August 1944, when Sturmbannführer Jacob Heinrich was captured south of Falise in France and interrogated by the Allies, he stated that Piper was, quote, particularly eager to execute the order to burn villages, unquote. Heinrich had previously served with Liebenstandarte, but was with SS Division Hitler Jungen at the time of his capture. The blowtorch became an unofficial symbol of the unit and was painted on the battalion's vehicles. In Nazi Propaganda on March 9, 1943, Piper was awarded Germany's highest decoration, the Knight's Cross of the Iron Cross. Himmler sent personal congratulations over the radio. Quote, Heartfelt congratulations for the Knight's Cross, my dear Jochen. I am proud of you. Unquote. During this period, the Nazi propaganda praised Piper as an outstanding leader. 
The official Waffen SS newspaper, the Black Corps, described Piper's actions in Kharkiv in glowing terms, such as, quote, the master of the situation in all its phases, unquote, and extolled Piper's, quote, quick decision making, unquote, quote, caring, unquote, attitude, and, quote, bold and unorthodox orders, unquote, backed by, quote, intellectual work and instinctive safety, unquote. The paper noted the, quote, unconditional trust of his men, unquote, and emphasized that he was, quote, a born leader, one filled with the highest sense of responsibility for the life of every single one of his men, but who was also able to be hard if necessary, unquote. The descriptions of his tactical skills propelled Piper to become an icon of the Waffen SS after the war with former battalion members describing him in glowing language. Piper was seen as an officer who obeyed orders without much discussion and expected the same of his men. In July 1943, the LSSAH took part in Operation Citadel in the area of Kursk, with Piper's unit distinguishing itself in the fighting. After the failure of the operation, on July 17th, the LSSAH was withdrawn from the Eastern Front and transferred to the area of Cuneo in northern Italy. Section 5. Italy and the Village of Boves After Italian forces capitulated to the Allies, the LSSAH was moved to Italy for two months to assist in disarming the Italian military and prevent them from attacking German forces. Beginning in August, Piper's battalion quarters were near Cuneo. On September 10th, they received orders to disarm Italian garrisons in Alessandria and Asti. On September 19th, partisans in the village of Boves captured two of Piper's men. Faustino Domasso, an advisor to the partisans, reported that when Piper arrived in Boves, the Germans appointed two Italians, one the village priest, to arrange the men's freedom. Piper promised the Germans would not engage in any reprisals. The two men were freed, but the Germans then set fire to the houses in the village and killed 22 men when they tried to flee. The burned bodies of the two Italian intermediaries were found among the victims. Piper himself reported on the action, now known as the Boves Massacre. Quote, I am of the opinion that our action to free our encircled comrades in Boves nipped in the bud the Italian army's attack, for the army fell apart and no attack ever took place on Cuneo or Turin. However, regrettable the consequences of our action was for the affected residents of Boves, it should not be overlooked that our one-time intervention prevented further immeasurable casualties, which would have resulted from continued Italian attacks, unquote. In 1968, an Italian court concluded there was, quote, insufficient suspicion of criminal activity on the part of any of the accused to warrant prosecution, unquote. On December 23, 1968, a German district court in Stuttgart reached the same conclusion, terminating any potential prosecution of Piper for his activities in Italy. Section 6. Return to the Eastern Front Beginning November 1943, Piper's unit arrived on the Eastern Front, where it took part in combat in the area of Zytomir. On November 20th, George Schoenberger was killed in action and Piper took his place as commander of the 1st SS Panzer Regiment, a position he held until the end of the war. Under his command, the regiment fought through the winter and was engaged in numerous night assaults against the Red Army. His Panzer unit played an essential role in stalling the Soviet offensive in the area of Zytomir. Piper led actions by attacking the rear of enemy lines and captured four division headquarters. For this action, he was awarded the Oak Leaves of the Knight's Cross. Piper's aggressiveness and regiment command appointment caused resentment by some against him. In the meantime, brutal combat involving his unit continued. On the 5th and 6th of December 1943, the unit killed 2,280 Soviet soldiers and took only three prisoners. During heavy fighting, the village of Pekarchina was completely burned with flamethrowers and its inhabitants killed. On January 20th, 1944, Piper was withdrawn from the front and left his unit. He went directly to the headquarters of Hitler, who presented him with the oak leaves to be added to his knight's cross. Shortly afterwards, on his 29th birthday, Piper was promoted to Obersturmbannführer. However, Piper was physically and mentally exhausted. A medical examination carried out by SS doctors in Dachau reached the conclusion that he needed rest. Therefore, he went to see his wife in Bavaria. Section 7. Belgium In March 1944, the LSSAH was withdrawn from the Eastern Front. The transfer of all of its units was not completed before May 24th. Piper joined his unit in April. The battles in the East had caused heavy losses of men and material. The new recruits were not of the same caliber as the pre-war volunteers, 
who had been recruited according to strict criteria. In Belgium, five young recruits accused of stealing poultry and ham from civilians were sentenced to death by a court-martial. The verdict seemed out of proportion to the offense, especially when looking at similar cases. Piper ordered the five shot on May 28, 1944, and had the other young recruits marched past the corpses. But the executions actually had a negative impact on the morale of the regiment. The stay in the Belgium Limburg was devoted mainly to drills and refit, made more difficult due to the lack of material and gasoline. Section 8. Battle of Normandy The Allied landing in Normandy necessitated the return of the LSSAH to the Western Front. On June 17th, the division began its move to the area of Caen, but some parts of the Panzer Regiment had to stay in Belgium awaiting new tanks. The whole division did not reach its rally zone before July 6, 1944. On June 28, the 1st SS Panzer Regiment of Piper arrived at the front and was immediately engaged in combat. As with the other German units of the area, they essentially fought a defensive battle until the Avranches breakthrough at the end of July and beginning of August. Having gone to the front with 19,618 men, the LSSAH lost 25% of its men and all of its tanks. As with most of the Waffen-SS divisions engaged in Normandy, the LSSAH lost its operational ability and was described in the official tables of the available units prepared by the OKW on September 16, 1944, not as a division, but as a Kampgruppe. Piper was not in command of his Panzer Regiment during the counterattacks near Avranches. Suffering from a nervous breakdown, he had been discreetly evacuated to a military hospital in the area of Saiz, 70 kilometers from the front line. According to the official diagnosis, he was suffering from jaundice. He would eventually be dispatched to the rear and from September 1944 forward was in a military hospital near the Tegnersi in Upper Bavaria. This was not far from his family home. He stayed there until October 7th. Section 9. Battle of the Bulge During the autumn, the German forces had to counter the attempts of the Western Allies to cross the West Wall, while Hitler was looking for an opportunity to seize the initiative on the Western Front. The result was the Operation Wacht am Rhein. In a desperate attempt to defeat the Allies on the Western Front, the German armies were to break through the U.S. lines in the Ardennes, to cross the River Meuse and take Antwerp, cutting the Allied forces in two. The main role in the breakthrough was devoted to the 6th Panzer Army under the command of Sepp Dietrich. He would have to pierce the American lines between Aachen and the Schnee Eiffel and seize bridges on the Moose and both sides of Liège. Within the 6th Panzer Army, a mobile striking role was assigned to the 1st SS Division Liebstandarte SS Adolf Hitler, or the LSSAH, under the command of SS Oberfuhrer Wilhelm Monk. The division was split into four Kampfgruppe, with Piper commanding the most substantial, which included all the armored sections of the division. Piper was given the use of the newest tank, the 70-ton Tiger II, or King Tiger, which would be taking part in its third battle on the Western Front since its introduction, and with its 7 inches of armor, made it impervious to Allied anti-tank weapons. However, the King Tiger had a high consumption of fuel, half mile to the gallon, along with mechanical defects, mainly the tank's suspension system, which would continuously hinder Piper's ability to reach his assigned objectives in Operation Walk and Rhine. His unit was to break through the U.S. lines along a route designated B through Spa, Belgium, and to take bridges on the Meuse between Liège and Hoy. Assigned Route Piper's assigned route, or Rollbahn, had many hairpin turns and traversed steep hillsides that delayed his already slow-moving towed artillery and bridging trains. It included narrow, in many places, a single-track roads which forced units of the Kampfgruppe to tail each other creating a column of infantry and armor up to 25 kilometers long. Piper complained that the road assigned to his Kampfgruppe was suitable for bicycles, but not for panzers. Fritz Kramer, chief of staff for the 6th Panzer Army, responded, quote, I don't care how and what you do, just make it to the moose, even if you've only one tank left when you get there, unquote. Piper's unit had only a quarter of the fuel that it needed. The plan counted on the capture of Allied fuel depots and keeping to an ambitious timetable. Initial advance stalled. Kampfgruppe Piper was initially delayed by more than 16 hours when the 1st Battalion, 9th Fallschirmjäger Regiment, 3rd Fallschirmjäger Division, 
took most of December 16th to defeat 18 men of the Intelligence and Reconnaissance Platoon, 394th Regiment, 99th Infantry Division, who blocked the route near the tiny village of Lanzarath, Belgium, in the Battle of Lanzarath Ridge. Piper's mechanized column did not reach his first day's objective until midnight that same day. As a result, Piper first attacked shortly before daybreak on December 17, 1944, almost 18 hours later than expected. Hustling through the remains of the American front lines, he quickly took Hansfeld. Piper had planned to advance through Losheimer Graben, but the 12th and 277th Volksgrenadier Divisions failed to gain control on the first day as planned. In the early morning of December 17th, they quickly captured Hansfeld and 50,000 U.S. gallons of fuel for his vehicles. Alternative Route Chosen Piper advanced towards Bulingen, keeping to the plan to move west and then turn south to detour around Huningen. He continued west on his assigned route until he had to deflect shortly before Lignoville because the assigned road was impassable. This bypass forced him towards the Bognez crossroads where his armored units encountered a lightly armored column of U.S. artillery observers who were quickly neutralized. Piper's unit became infamous for the murder of U.S. prisoners of war at the crossroads in what became known as the Malmedy Massacre, as noted below. Moving ahead, he crossed Lignoville and reached the heights of Stavelot on the left bank of the Ambla River at nightfall of the second day of Operation Walked M. Rhine. While the little city was defended only by a few U.S. troops, and could have been easily taken the same day. For reasons unknown, he held back and assaulted at dawn of the next day. Valuable time was lost, allowing the Americans to reorganize. After heavy fighting, his Kampfgruppe eventually managed to cross the bridge on the river Embleve, and from there, he found the going increasingly difficult. The U.S. forces regrouped themselves and blasted the bridges on the Embleve and River Somme that Piper needed to cross in order to continue on a direct road to the Moose. On December 18th, United States Army Corps of Engineers blasted the bridges in front of him that he needed to reach his objective, trapping him in the deep valley of the Embleve, downstream from Trois Ponts. The weather had also improved, permitting the Allied Air Forces to operate. Several P-47 squadrons attacked his column spread over 20 kilometers. The airstrikes destroyed or heavily damaged numerous vehicles of his Kampfgruppe and made some parts of his itinerary impractical, slowing down his progression. Piper was unable to protect his rear, which enabled American troops to recapture and destroy the bridge on the Amblev in Stavelot, cutting him off from the only possible supply road for ammunition and, above all, fuel, which he lacked. In spite of these problems, Piper continued his progress towards Stumont before American resistance forced him to retire to Leglise. Short of fuel, men, and ammunition, he held out during six days of U.S. Army bombardment and counterattacks. Without supplies and with no contact with other German units behind him, Piper decided on December 24th to abandon his vehicles and march through the woods to escape. He left with the remaining 800 men, and 36 hours later, he reached the German lines with 770 men, having covered 20 kilometers by foot in deep snow and freezing temperatures. End of the War In January 1945, the swords were added to his Knight's Cross. The proposal was drafted by Wilhelm Monk, the great fame of Piper as a Waffen-SS commander during the, quote, Battle of the Bulge, unquote, was born. At the end of January 1945, Piper was in the Berlin area. On February 4th, he met for the last time with Himmler at his provisional headquarters. Piper then went to the Panzer Grenadier School in Kronis until February 14th. From there, he joined his unit in the southwest of the area of Fernad. His unit took part in Operation Spring Awakening, which failed. Although Piper's unit inflicted a large number of casualties, due to his aggressive style of command, he lost many men and numerous old companions. On May 1st, as other units of the LSSAH were forced to retreat into Austria, the men were informed of Adolf Hitler's death. A few days later, all SS units were ordered to retreat to the west. On May 8th, the LSSAH received the order to cross the Enns River, and surrender to the American troops. Accompanied by Paul Gould, Piper tried to escape captivity and make his way home. On May 22nd, Piper and Gould were captured near Sklerzy. Through July 1945, he was held in a POW camp at Fuchtwangen in Bavaria. 
Although he was actively sought by American forces due to his alleged involvement in the Malmedy Massacre, Piper was not identified until August 21, 1945. This was the day after he was transferred to the interrogation camp of the 3rd U.S. Army in Freising. Section 10. War Crimes Malmedy During the 1st SS Panzer Division's advance on December 17, 1944, his armored units and half-tracks confronted a lightly armed convoy of about 30 American vehicles at the Bautnez Crossroads near Malmedy. The troops, mainly elements of the American 285th Field Artillery Observation Battalion, were quickly overcome and captured. Along with the other American POWs previously captured, they were ordered to stand in a meadow when for unknown reasons the Germans opened fire on the prisoners with machine guns, killing 84 soldiers and leaving the bodies in the snow. The survivors were able to reach American lines later that day, and their stories spread rapidly throughout the American front lines. Author Richard Gallagher reported that during the briefing held before the operation, Piper clearly stated that no quarter should be given, no prisoners taken, and that no pity should be shown towards the Belgian civilians. However, Lt. Col. Hal McCown, commander of the 2nd Battalion, 119th Infantry Regiment, testified about the treatment his unit was given after being captured on December 21st by Piper's Kampfgruppet at Freud Corps between La Glisse and Stumont. McCown said that he met Piper in person, and based on his observations, American prisoners were at no time mistreated by the SS, and the food given to them was nearly as good as that used by the Germans themselves. Other Murders Piper's men engaged in other murders of prisoners. In Hansfeld, men in Kampfgruppe Piper murdered several American prisoners. Other murders of POWs and civilian population were reported in Boulingen, Lignaville, Stavelot, Chinot, Laglise, Stumont, and Werrith on December 17th, 18th, 19th, and 20th. On December 19th, 1944, in the area between Stavelot and Trois Ponts, while the Germans were trying to regain control of the bridge over the Amblin River, crucial for allowing reinforcements and supplies to reach the Kampfgruppe, men of Kampfgruppe Piper killed a number of Belgian civilians. Kampfgruppe Piper was eventually declared responsible for the deaths of 362 prisoners of war and 111 civilians. Interrogation After the surrender of the German armies, some war crimes during the, quote, Battle of the Bulge, unquote, were attributed to Kampfgruppe Piper, resulting in American investigative teams searching POW camps for its men. Jailed in Freising, Upper Bavaria, Piper underwent his first interrogations. Investigators quickly found that the SS men, including Piper, although hardened soldiers, were not trained to withstand interrogation. Some men freely gave the requested information, while others only did so after having been allegedly subject to various forms of torture, such as beatings, threats, and mock executions. Piper took command responsibility for the actions of the men under his command. In December 1945, Piper was transferred to the prison at Schwabisch Hall, where 1,000 former members of the Liebstandarte were assembled. On April 16, 1946, approximately 300 prisoners were moved from Schwabisch Hall to Dachau, where they were put on trial. Trial The trial took place at Dachau from May 16th to July 16th, 1946, before a military tribunal of senior American officers operating under rules established by the Nuremberg International Military Tribunal. The 74 defendants included SS Oberst Gruppenführer Sepp Dietrich, 6th SS Panzer Army Commanding General, his Chief of Staff SS Brigade Führer Fritz Kramer, SS Gruppenführer Hermann Price, 1st SS Panzer Corps Commander, and Joachim Piper, commander of the 1st SS Panzer Regiment, the unit to which the crimes were attributed. Before the trial, occupation authorities reclassified the defendants from prisoners of war to civilian internees. The accusations were mainly based on the sworn and written statements provided by the defendants in Schwabisch Hall. To counter the evidence given in the men's sworn statements and by prosecution witnesses, the lead defense attorney, Lt. Col. Willis M. Everett, tried to show that the statements had been obtained by inappropriate methods. Everett called Lt. Col. Hal McCown to testify about Piper's troops' treatment of American prisoners at Leglise. McCown, who along with his command, had been captured by Piper at Leglise, 
testified that wounded American soldiers in Piper's custody had received equal priority with German wounding in receiving medical treatment. He testified that during his occupation of the town, Piper had at all times behaved in a professional and honorable manner. Everett had decided to call only Piper to testify. However, other defendants, supported by their German lawyers, wanted to testify as well. This would soon prove to be a huge mistake, for when the prosecution cross-examined the defendants, they behaved like, quote, a bunch of drowning rats turning on each other, unquote. According to Everett, these testimonies gave the court enough reason to sentence several of the defendants to death. The military court was not convinced by Piper's testimony about the murder of the POWs under the Kampfgruppe's control. During the trial, several witnesses testified of at least two instances in which Piper had ordered the murder of prisoners of war. When questioned by the prosecution, Piper denied these allegations, stating that the allegations were obtained from witnesses under torture. When questioned about the murder of Belgian civilians, Piper said they were partisans. Although the court could not prove that Piper had ordered the murders, Piper nonetheless accepted responsibility for his men's actions. Death Sentence Together with 42 other defendants, Joachim Piper was sentenced to death by hanging on July 16, 1946. The sentences generated significant controversy in some German circles, including the church, leading the commander of the U.S. Army in Germany to commute some of the death sentences to life imprisonment. In addition, the German's defense attorney, U.S. military attorney Lieutenant Colonel Willis M. Everett, appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court, claiming that the defendants had been found guilty by means of, quote, illegal and fraudulently procured confession, unquote, and were subjects of mock trial. The turmoil raised by this case caused the Secretary of the Army, Kenneth Royal, to create a commission chaired by Judge Gordon A. Simpson of Texas to investigate. The commission was interested in the Malmetti Massacre trial and in other cases judged at DeKalb. The commission arrived in Europe on July 30, 1948, and issued its report on September 14. In this report, it notably recommended that the 12 remaining death sentences be commuted to life imprisonment. The commission confirmed the accuracy of Everett's accusations regarding mock trials, and neither disputed nor denied his charges of torture of the defendants. The commission expressed the opinion that the pretrial investigation had not been properly conducted, and that members felt that no death sentence should be executed where such a doubt existed. In response, General Lucius Clay commuted six more death sentences to life imprisonment, but he refused to commute the six remaining death sentences, including Piper's, though the executions were postponed. The turmoil caused by the commission report caused the U.S. Senate to investigate the trial. Investigations were opened in the early 1950, including several Senate committees, on one of which was Joseph McCarthy, prepared to launch his sensationalist career. Receiving encouragement and information from right-wing and anti-Semitic circles, McCarthy dominated the proceedings and grabbed headlines. He was also probably encouraged by the right-wing anti-Semitic judge Leroy Van Roden, who saw the trials as being a Jewish effort to take revenge on the Germans, and who also served on the investigating commissions. In its investigation of the trial, the Senate Committee on Armed Services came to the conclusion of improper pretrial procedures including a mock trial, but not torture as sometimes stated, had indeed affected the trial process. There was little or no doubt that some of the accused were indeed guilty of the massacre. Release from Prison A popular Wehrmacht ex-general, Heinz Guderian, actively campaigned for Piper. For example, he wrote to one of his subordinates in 1951, quote, At the moment I'm negotiating with General Handy Heilberg because he wants to hang the unfortunate Piper. McCloy is powerless because the Malmetti trial is being handled by Yukon and is not subordinate to McCloy. As a result, I have decided to cable President Truman and ask him if he is familiar with this idiocy." Unquote. Ultimately, the sentence of the Malmetti defendants were commuted to life imprisonment and then to time served. Piper's sentence was commuted to 35 years in 1954, and he was released in December 1956, the last of the Malmetti condemned to be freed. He had served 11 and a half years in prison. HIAG, an organization of former Waffen-SS members, had already helped Piper's wife find a job near the Landsberg prison. They then worked to achieve the conditional release of Piper himself. To obtain his release from prison, Piper had to prove that he could obtain a job. Through the intermediary of Dr. Albert Prinzing, a former SS Hauptsturmführer in the Seeker Heinsteins, he got a job at the car manufacturer Porsche. Section 11. 
returned to civilian life. Following his release from Landsberg Prison, Piper was careful not to associate too closely with former Waffen SS men and their organization, HIAG, at least publicly. However, privately he maintained contact with and was closely involved with many former SS members. In 1959, for example, he attended the national meeting of the Association of Knights Cross Recipients. He drove down with HIAG's official historian, Walter Harzer, with the express hope of seeing Kurt, quote, Panzer, unquote, Meyer. He missed Meyer, but was able to see Sepp Dietrich and Heinz Lammerding at the closed-door meeting. He was often seen at the funerals of personalities such as Meyer, Dietrich, and Paul Hauser. Piper assisted the efforts of these organizations to rehabilitate the Waffen SS reputation by hiding the more ruthless aspects of their past and exalting their military achievements, claiming that the SS were just like other soldiers. Piper once told one of his friends, quote, I personally think that every attempt at rehabilitation during our lifetime is unrealistic, but one can still collect material, unquote. On January 17, 1957, he began work at Porsche in Stuttgart in its technical division. He would later represent the company at car exhibitions. He was later put in charge of auto exports to the United States, but his wartime criminal conviction prevented him from obtaining a visa for travel to the United States. This would not allow him to maintain this new position. As he advanced within Porsche, he was accused by Italian Union workers of the Boves Massacre in Italy during World War II. Ferry Porsche personally intervened and promised Piper a senior management position, but this offer was derailed by the trade unions, who objected to allowing persons convicted of war crimes to serve in the upper management of the company. The strong antipathy to Piper, his association with Ferry Porsche, and the related negative impact on sales in Porsche's biggest market, the United States, forced Porsche's management to dismiss him. On December 30, 1960, Piper filed suit to compel Porsche to fulfill its promises. In court documents, Piper's attorney stated that Piper was not a war criminal and that the Allies had used the trials to defame the German people. He asserted that the Nuremberg trial and the, quote, Malmedy massacre, unquote, trial were merely propaganda. Citing documents published by the anti-communist activist and McCarthyist, as well as controversial scholar and Holocaust denier, Freda Utley, he asserted that the Malmedy massacre trial defendants had been tortured by the Americans. At the request of the court, Porsche and Piper reached an agreement to terminate the employment contract, and Piper received six months of wages as compensation. HIAG's official periodical, Der Freewillig, capitalized on the reward and wrote that Piper had been, quote, unfairly sentenced, unquote, for war crimes. Piper became a car sales trainer for Volkswagen. 1960s. At the beginning of the 1960s, the perception that the public opinion had of the Nazi crimes started to change. The German economic recovery did not allow SS men to hide themselves, and holding a high position in society could raise questions that people like Piper preferred to avoid. The Eichmann and Auschwitz trials in the first half of the 1960s, which got a large audience in West Germany, put a new light on this period. The prosecution was now initiated by the West German authorities themselves, and no longer by the Allies. On the other hand, the statute of limitations for the prosecution of Nazi crimes had been extended several times which made those who had been involved in these crimes uncomfortable. In the early 1960s, Piper's name came up several times in war crimes trials in Germany. He was mentioned in the proceedings against Karl Wolf, Himmler's senior adjutant, which began in early 1962 and concluded in 1964 with a 15-year sentence. Werner Grothmann, Piper's successor as Himmler's adjutant, was also under investigation. In both of these proceedings, the court heard testimony from a notorious former SS member Eric von dem bach zelewski covering Himmler's pre-invasion designs to, quote, rid Russia of 30 million Slavic people, unquote, or his pronouncements following the Minsk killings that he was, quote, determined to eliminate the Jews, unquote. In 1964, Piper learned that the village of Boves had installed a memorial naming his command as perpetrators of the massacre. He immediately got in touch with others from his unit to coordinate a defense strategy. Mostly, it consisted of blaming the communists for manufacturing false accusations and insisting that the destruction of the village was due to a fierce battle with partisans. In the course of the investigation, they had to file statements. Piper claimed his unit massacred no civilians in Bowes. He stated that he sent members of his unit to search for the two kidnapped officers taken by partisans into the nearby Basalta Mountains. A platoon was ambushed, and while attempting to rescue it, 
the Germans came under heavy fire from the partisans. It was the response of the German artillery to his fighting that triggered the fires reported in the village. Piper claimed that the artillery section remained in Boves to destroy the remaining weapons and ammunition. On June 23, 1964, criminal charges were filed against Piper at the Central Office of the State Justice Administration for the investigation of National Socialist crimes in Ludwigsburg to do with the Boves massacre. The charges included statements from two former Italian partisans who recognized Piper from a book on the Battle of the Bulge and a photograph of Piper taken as the village burned below his position. The plaintiffs were represented by Robert W. Kempner, who had been a member of the American Council of Prosecutors during the Nuremberg Trials. Separate charges were filed against Piper in December 1964 by Simon Wiesenthal. The investigations led by the Attorney General of Stuttgart involved Piper being accused of having arrested Jews in Borgo San Dalmaso and of having deported Jews from northern Italy. However, neither Klempner nor Wiesenthal were ever able to present the evidence claimed by the Attorney General. In 1967, the case was dismissed for lack of evidence. Piper was later called as a witness during the Werner Best trial. He did not deny having had close contact with Himmler, but he managed to avoid being directly implicated in Nazi war crimes by claiming memory failure. In 1969, Piper was a freelance contributor to the magazine Auto, Motor und Sport. In 1972, he moved to Traves in haut saone France, where he owned property. At that time, he was a self-employed translator for the publisher Stuttgarter Motor Buch Verlag. Under the pen name of, quote, Rainer Buschmann, unquote, he translated books devoted to military history from English to German. Last Years and Death Residing in France since 1972, Piper led a quiet and discreet life. However, he continued to use his given name. In 1974, he was identified by a former communist resistance member of the region who issued a report for the French Communist Party. In 1976, a communist historian investigating the Gestapo archives found the Piper file. On June 21st, tracts denouncing his presence were distributed in Traves. A day later, an article in the left-wing publication La Humanité revealed Piper's presence in Traves and he received threats that his house would be burned down and his dogs killed. On receipt of these threats, Piper, who remained in Traves, sent his family back to Germany. During the night of July 13th and 14th, 1976, Bastille Day, Piper's home was attacked. In the ruin, Piper's charred corpse was found together with a 22 caliber rifle and a pistol. The perpetrators were never identified. Investigation found that intruders had cut a wire fence between the house and neighboring properties. All three of Piper's dogs had been wounded. Traces of shot and spent shell casings consistent with the rifle, shotgun, and revolver Piper had to protect himself were found outside, suggesting that he had fired at the intruders from outside the house. But if they had had guns of their own, they may not have fired them all since no bullets or shot was found at the places Piper had fired from. Instead, the attackers had thrown firebombs, including at least one Molotov cocktail, at the house to start the fire, which arson specialists found had been set in three locations at once. Just outside the house, they found some clothing belonging to Piper's wife, as well as some personal papers, including his last letter to her, and a binocular. Piper's body, burnt down to a mere 60 centimeters or 24 inches, was found in the remains of his study, where the papers would have been kept. Based on the evidence, investigators with the Dijon Police Judiciaire concluded that Piper had heard the intruders enter his property and left the house to fire at them. When that did not prevent the firebombing, he returned to the house in an attempt to save his and his wife's valuables by throwing them out the study window, continuing to fire at the attackers outside. While the body was too badly burned to determine the exact cause of death, the official conclusion was that he died of smoke inhalation in the attempt and not at the hands of the attackers. Erwin Kettlehut, a former Leap Stundarte artillery captain who had rented the house to his wartime commander, identified the remains the morning after the fire. Sigurd Piper wanted her husband's body buried in Germany, so it was transported back there, where by law an autopsy had to be performed. His head was initially missing. When it arrived later, it had been cut into sections, splitting the only remaining tooth. Joachim Piper is buried with his family at St. Anna's Church in the Bavarian village of Schondorf M. Amersi. A group calling itself the Avengers claimed responsibility for his death. The charred remains of the house briefly became a visitor attraction. The circumstances of his death have led to allegations that it was faked.
Section 12. Assessment. Because of the murders perpetrated by his unit at Malmedy and other locations, his death sentence and subsequent release, Piper remained a controversial figure while he lived and after his death. He was a competent, personally courageous soldier and highly respected among his peers. His men were fiercely loyal to him, and he was considered by many to be a, quote, charismatic leader, unquote. After the end of the war, he continued to be held in high regard by his surviving comrades, many of whom talked of Dare Piper with admiration and respect. The respect he had garnered among his SS peers helped him to obtain his release from prison after the war ended and to obtain employment. Historians Ronald Smelser and Edward J. Davies note that Piper is, quote, one of the heroes of the Americans who romanticized the Wehrmacht, and especially the Waffen-SS, unquote. Within the framework of the Cold War and the McCarthy era, he had been, quote, transformed from villain to hero, unquote. His behavior at trial, his physical appearance, and his decorations all aided in the process. Smelser and Davies conclude, quote, here in the flesh was the perfect mythical man, both a tragic and heroic figure, unquote. Section 13, Awards. Iron Cross, 1939. Second Class, May 31st, 1940. And First Class, July 12th, 1940. Infantry Assault Badge in Bronze, September 7th, 1940. German Cross in Gold on May 6th, 1943 as SS Sturbannführer and commander of the 3rd SS Panzer Grenadier Regiment, 12th, quote, Liebstandarte SS Adolf Hitler, unquote. Tank Destruction Badge, July 21st, 1943. Close Combat Clasp in Bronze, September 7th, 1943. And in Silver, October 20th, 1943. Knight's Cross of the Iron Cross with Oak Leaves and Swords. Knight's Cross on March 9th, 1943 as SS Sturban Fuhrer and commander of the 3rd SS Panzer Grenadier Regiment II, quote, Liebstandarte SS Adolf Hitler, unquote. Oak Leaves on January 27, 1944, as SS Obersturmbahn Fuhrer and commander of SS Panzer Regiment I, quote, Liebstandarte SS Adolf Hitler, unquote. Swords on January 11, 1945, as SS Obersturmbahn Fuhrer and commander of SS Panzer Regiment I, quote, Liebstandarte SS Adolf Hitler, unquote. This sound file and all text in the article are licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike 3.0 unported license, available at http colon forward slash forward slash creativecommons.org forward slash licenses forward slash by dash sa forward slash 3.0.